Um, you want flights of fancy? This is more like a slog through the TSA line. <laughs> uh, I'm going to look at seven types of poetic imagery as experienced while working in telemarketing. Seven types of poetic imagery are visual, gustatory, olfactory, tactile, organic, kinesthetic, and auditory. Visual. I'll pay you five dollars to draw a dick on that motivational poster of the Blade Runner in the copy room when no one's looking. <laughs> Gustatory. It's gluten-free decaf, why? <laughs> well, Lynn, we seem to have a room full of Lynn's tonight. This is good. Lynn's my roommate, she's here. Olfactory. God. Damn it, who torched the popcorn in the kitchen and effing stinks in here? <laughs> Tactile. Shit! Paper cut. <laughs> Organic. Five minute break. Let's go smoke some weed outside. <laughs> Kinesthetic. <clears throat> Sorry to bother you, man, but there's no ergonomic chair for your phone station. We have this milk crate instead. <laughs> Auditory. Okay, here's how you deal with a customer who wants a refund. Tell them, please hold while I connect you with a customer service supervisor. Now, leave them on hold for 28 minutes while they listen to that trance version of the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald <laughs> inflected with panpipes and Tibetan ululations. <laughs> they usually hang up after about five minutes. Okay. This is called, uh, it says, reminds me to check your skirt. Right, my skirt didn't write up good. Okay. <laughs> it comes with the territory of being an Aspie. Okay, I, I put on clothing inside out. My skirts will be on backwards all my life. Okay. Uh, there is a form of poetry called the pantoum. It is a 16th century Malaysian poetic form in which all the lines in the poem are used twice. Um, now, this is a movie that's set in a telemarketing tableau. These people annoy other people for a living, so the poem is not going to be any damned good, okay? <laughs> but, but the form will be impeccable, so here we go. You know, what, one thing that is great, by the way, about, uh, about the movie, uh, Sorry to Bother You, is that Stephen Yun is in it, for those in the know. Okay. The Telemarketer's Pantoum. Sorry to bother you, but my testimony could be a real opportunity. Let me tell you, this gig was a real step up for me. I used to be a sign flipper. So today, I'm calling to recruit you for our next multi-level opening. No, this is not about ED pills or saving 15% or more on car insurance. Let me tell you, this gig was a real step up for me. I used to be a sign flipper. That was me in the Fiesta insurance costume, a black crow with a jaunty yellow hat. No, this is not about ED pills or saving 15% or more on car insurance. MS-13 enforcer or fruit cart vendor, dude, you can bring home $500 to $800 a week. That was me in the Fiesta insurance costume, a black crow with a jaunty yellow hat. I tell you, they saw potential, real potential, so long as I left the dignity at home. MS-13 enforcer or fruit cart vendor, dude, you can bring home $500 to $800 a week. Work from home. You can dress for Comic-Con. Who cares? Get your freak on. <laughs> I tell you, they saw potential, real potential, so long as I left the dignity at home. Living wage and benefits? No, not a ixnay. But if I can bring you in, Work from home. You can dress for Comic-Con. Who cares? Get your freak on. Why wait? Act now. We'll throw in our free book, Arbitrage for Dumbasses. <laughs> Living wage and benefits? No, not a ixnay. But if I can bring you in, so today, 
I am calling to recruit you for our next multi-level opening. Why wait? Act now. We'll throw in our free book, Arbitrage for Dumbasses. Sorry to bother you, but my testimony could be a real opportunity. Telemarketing and 16th century Malaysian poetry. Who knew it would work? Okay, note, check skirt again, good. All right. Uh, now, this poem, Complete Tone Shift. Uh, this will not be funny. But um, this is a different kind of sorry to bother you. Um, this is about somebody who tore me up pretty bad 30 years ago. Um, and the only way that I can't be away from him is when he shows up in my dreams. So this is called Blast Radius. When I wake up, my feet hit the tiled floor and the house is 32 degrees. Okay, got my attention. As the dream evaporates, I shiver and draw my hands across the old injury, now scar tissue that flutters with nerves and connective memory, skin, fat, imagined muscle, cover the gap between autonomy and longing. Were you just here? Oh yes, you were here. And you took all the warm air in the room with you. I pad off to the bathroom, pressing my palms and fanning out my fingers across the site where I was left unsutured nearly 30 years ago. Beneath my fingertips, the seat of self-judgment rapidly loses body heat. Why this utterly sucks? I will feel the negative space of your phantom with me for the rest of the day. Unable to pack my spilled innards back into place, they will never fit there again. Such is the nature of these recurring awakenings. Your departure sustains a terrible wind chill factor. My hands return to hold my integrity in place. It is the only thing that does not seep through my fingers. I never know when these dreams will recur. I may nod off innocently preoccupied with thoughts of my sweetheart's cock, its unrush filling me to capacity, an avalanche. Things are so much better these days. But beneath all that is the flutter, the years later seismic pings, the reminder that the ground may open up once more to swallow me. Sometimes the earth swallows me. Sometimes the earth swallows my children, the children I never had. In these dreams, you never look at me. You never speak to me. It will take a full day to slough you off from my body for, oh, how the ghost of you, well, it does not let go. This June, it will be 30 years since you left. Two Junes prior, you found my glasses and left me an explanatory note that ended with the word, eh. And you covered me with a blue plaid blanket so I would not catch cold. It was the June five years ago that the IED you tucked beneath my folded sleeping hands detonated at first and I awoke to find that I had been dreaming all along of John Hurt's character in Alien, dressed in white, stretched supine on the Nostromo crew's supper table as the truth of what you did reached its way up and out from the perch of justice, splitting belly skin, throwing the entire cosmos into chaos, elbowing the ribs apart, an archangel of suffering springing from my breadbasket to feast upon the unsuspecting world. My sweetheart has told me that he gets incredibly pissed off when he thinks about how badly men have treated me, how I didn't deserve it, how I'm such a good person. All he knows about the blast radius is that it yielded that rude thing that devoured my children. He knows that the weight gathers there to protect my soul, its survival and capacity to love anew, yet miraculous. He doesn't know that the beast has a name. He doesn't ask what happened. He simply reaches for me to soothe him. These are for me the best days ever, because he sees me when he looks at me, because he doesn't judge my belly, only my tears. Mm -hmm. I want to tell him, become 
an open parenthesis at my back. Reach over and splay your hands across the blast radius. Caress me there until I slip into sleep without fallout. Do not let these dreams revisit me, not in our bed, not with your gallbladder seam flirting with my spine, not with you murmuring, you're beautiful, and this too shall pass into my ear. Draw a kindly blanket over my shivering frame. Kiss my forehead. Leave me a gentle note with my glasses. Assure me that the evil abroad in the land will not prevail. Please whisper, I see it, Amelie. I see the chasm. Even as it is unseeable, I will not take my hands away until you are warm there once again. Thank you.